everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> We're banging on Tulio's. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. I would like to thank you so, so much for being here. It's such a delight and a privilege to introduce uh, Carolyn Riccardelli from uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, Carolyn and I have known each other for over 20 years. She was in my first class of students in the art conservation program at Buffalo, and she survived. And so <laughs> she survived me, too. I mean, I'm <laughs> and went on to be an absolute superstar in the field. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background information uh, about Carolyn. She is conservator in the Department of Objects Conservation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she's responsible for structural issues related to large-scale objects, exactly what we're going to be hearing about today. From 2005 to 2014, her primary project was Tullio Lombardo's Atom, for which she was the principal member of a team of conservators and scientists conducting research on adhesives and pinning materials, as well as developing innovative methods for reassembling the damaged sculpture. So can you imagine for nine years you are working on the same sculpture? I mean, people often talk about the magic of conservation and the magic is the time and the dedication and the energy that we put into these projects. And I want to say that the New York Times was following closely this entire time and I felt um, ba somewhat badly for the people working on this project, how much media attention it was getting and how phenomenally they were handling it all. Carolyn is also committed to the educational development of conservators in training, and she's one of the coordinators for an active graduate internship program in the Objects Conservation Center at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She's a frequent lecturer at uh, the NYU Conservation Center, Woodpack, which is the Delaware Art Conservation Program, and Buffalo, speaking about adhesives and pinning techniques for marble and ceramics conservation, and we hope she'll be frequent speaker here at the BGC too. Carolyn also does uh, archaeological conservation. She's worked uh, in Turkey at archaeological excavations at Sardis and more recently at the Met's Egyptian excavations at Dashur and Lisht. Carolyn is a fellow of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works and has served on the AIC Board of Directors, the AIC Publications Committee, as an officer in the Object Specialty Group. She holds a BA in Anthropology from Newcomb College at Tulane University and an MA from the Art Conservation Program at Buffalo State College. So please join me in welcoming Carolyn. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm just going to jump in and um, take you for this journey. <laughs> and um, I hope you enjoy it. And we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. I have here with me, we can pass these around if you want during the talk, this model, which you'll see appear in my talk, uh, which was made from <coughs> 3D laser scans of the sculpture's fragments. This was made by Ron Street. Um, and this was a really valuable tool throughout our project, but it's really helpful because it tells, shows exactly where all the breaks are on Adam. Um, I also have uh, the, the pins, the size of the pins that we put into the sculpture and a little piece of epoxy that shows you um, the reversible pinning technique that we used. And then finally, I have uh, this beautiful publication of the Metropolitan Museum Journal, which has three uh, beautiful articles about the um, sculpture, two, two about art historically about Adam, and then one pretty substantial article by the conservation team. And that's, most, that's what I'll be talking about today, but this is a very nice uh, publication, which I, you can still get it. I think you'd have to ask the bookstore to order it for you, but the PDFs of all these articles are free on the website, to, on the Met's website to download. So anybody can access these anytime. So I'll just leave those there, and if you want to pass them around, we can do it at the end, too. So, <coughs> so I'm going to talk about the um, conservation process of Tulio Lombardo's Adam 
And I want to illustrate how a multidisciplinary team challenged standard treatment practice to develop what we believe to be a new model for the conservation of large-scale marble sculpture. So, oh, uh, forward. Here we go. <coughs> Excuse me, my little cough. The gifted Venetian sculptor Tullia Lombardo created Adam for the funerary monument of the doge Andrea Vendermann in the early 1490s. <coughs> the sculpture is extraordinary not only because of its art historical importance as the first monumental nude of the Renaissance that closely follows the idealism of ancient Roman antiquities, but because in the words of museum curator Luke Sison, it constitutes one of the most profound contemplations of divine and artistic creation ever realized. The Vendermann Monument is now located in the church of Santi Giovanni e Paolo in Venice, but the figure of Adam, which was originally located here, was, uh, as well as his counterpart Eve, which was located here, were removed in the early 19th century because their nudity had been judged inappropriate for a church interior. At first moved to the Vendermann Palace, Adam passed through a number of distinguished European collections before being purchased by the Met in 1936. At the museum in 2002, Adam was located on, in the Vela's Blanco patio in just about the same location that you see here. On Sunday, October 6th of that year, shortly after the museum had closed for the night, the pedestal supporting the sculpture collapsed, sending Adam crashing to the floor. I'll let you take that in. <laughs> <laughs> there were no witnesses present at the time of the accident. Museum security discovered the sculpture that evening and the tragic consequences of the collapse were immediately apparent. On impact, this 780 pound life-size sculpture made of fine Carrara marble broke into 28 recognizable pieces and hundreds of smaller fragments. Fortunately, the face and torso were relatively unscathed in the fall, but the arms, which bore the brunt of the impact, the lower legs, and the tree trunk suffered major damage. The following day, the fragments were retrieved systematically using the rectangular marble floor tiles as a grid, allowing conservators to keep track of the locations in hopes that they might be uh, useful later when assembling the sculpture. The shock and distress of the museum staff in the wake of this tragic accident can hardly be overstated, but the decision to reconstruct Adam was made almost immediately. From the outset, however, it was clear that this treatment would be a formidable project, posing an unusual, perhaps even unprecedented series of challenges. The art historical significance of Adam and the extent of the damage warranted a multidisciplinary collaboration to, ex to investigate new approaches to a large-scale sculpture treatment. And so uh, this team of specialists was gathered together. Over a period of 12 years, this team conducted extensive research in an effort to find the most suitable conservation treatment plan. The treatment began in earnest in 2005 after the core team was fully assembled. The first few years, few years were dedicated to the examination of the fragments and planning for reconstruction. And here you see some of the 28 recognizable pieces, and these are the hundreds of small fragments, which were kept in little bags so that we could keep track of the original Vela's Blanco floor locations and protect them from damage. One of the first tasks of the reconstruction was to find locations for these small fragments. First, we separated out the internal fragments, the ones without the colored skin of the, of the sculpture, um, because we really felt those were unlikely to be re relocated, and those were just put aside for safekeeping. And then we began to find locations for the small fragments, um, the external fragments, and we knew we couldn't immediately just adhere them in place once we found a location, because we didn't want to lock ourselves out if another fragment were found at a later date. So we developed a system to keep track of the fragments using sequential 
annotated photographs to document locations so we could easily reconstruct and bond specific areas when the time came, which in most cases was many years later. <laughs> that was the top of the tree trunk that sits next to up here. Um, collecting and relocating fragments is the obvious practical task following such an accident, but the story of this project can be seen as a balance between virtual and material reality, regularly navigating the porous border between theory and practice. Moving from what is desirable to what is doable required us to achieve a full material and structural understanding of the sculpture, to test specific materials and methods, and to evaluate the feasibility of implementing the outcomes of our research. Relatively early in the project, a one-fifth scale model of Adam, which is live here in the room, <laughs> um, he's, he's 16 inches tall, it was created with data from the 3D laser scans of the major fragments. And this little model was an invaluable tool throughout the project. And you must remember that we just had fragments lying on tables. And this was the only <coughs> three-dimensional representation of the sculpture that we had at that time. And it really helps to illustrate some of the issues that would influence the way we started to think about reconstructing Adam. So if you take a look at the image, first you'll notice that there are twice as many breaks on the left leg as there are on the right. The high quality of the Carrara marble resulted in very clean breaks that fit together tightly. Therefore, we knew that displacement of the fragments from any added adhesive would become one of our primary concerns. While many of the breaks are in compression, <coughs> that is straight across or parallel to the floor, <coughs> There are a few critical joints that experience a combination of compressive, tensile, and shear, or slipping, stress. One of the most critical joints is at the ankles, where the weight of the entire sculpture rests on the smallest surface area. And these breaks are at a really acute angle. Another break that has a combination of compressive and shear stress is in the knee, where we have a wedge-shaped fragment bridging the shin and the thigh of the left leg. The sculpture weighs 780 pounds and the ankles support 85 to 90% of that weight. The breaks highlighted here guided much of our materials research. And in fact, these joints are the only places we ended up using pins in the reconstruction, which is kind of a big deal <laughs> for, for sculpture conservation. <coughs> One of the most important phases in the Tulio project, the engineering analysis, began with laser scanning. Um, to create a virtual 3D model of the sculpture, each fragment was scanned individually and then stitched together. This was painstaking work that happened over a two year period and which produced the variety of model formats you see here in the slide. The completed model was used to perform finite element analysis or FEA which is a computer-based engineering analysis <coughs> that can reveal the distribution of stresses and strains in a structure. That analysis was carried out by an outside firm called Computer Aided Engineering, and they're based in Connecticut. <coughs> by the end of the analysis, we knew just how much force was acting on each joint in the sculpture, and we knew that the load or force on any particular joint does not exceed 100 pounds per square inch. And this would be very important information as we moved on to the next phase of the project, materials testing, specifically adhesives and pinning testing, which I'm just gonna briefly summarize today. Overall, um, our goal was to find adhesives and pinning materials that would closely match the characteristics of marble. In other words, we didn't want our adhesives to be much stronger than necessary, um, or our pins to be much stiffer than marble. Um, and the studies took into consideration our primary goals for the treatment. The first was minimal intervention, specifically minimal pinning, which goes against the traditional conservation method that calls for a pin at each fracture. And we wanted to really th rethink that approach. Our next goal was to achieve reversibility or retreatability. Traditionally, epoxy has been used to repair large sculpture, 
but these adhesives are not considered reversible. Finally, we wanted to achieve very thin glue joins. Much of what we had to draw on in terms of past research on large-scale sculpture was repaired, uh, was based on the treatment of ancient sculpture, which often has large gaps between the joins due to degradation of fracture surfaces over time in burial, as well as from campaigns from previous restorations. Because the joins in Adam's legs were very tight, and because there was an uneven number of breaks in the left and right legs, the thinness of the joins had a direct effect on the success of the treatment. All of these studies were carried out under the supervision of George Wheeler by his Columbia University students, conservators at the Met, and the material scientists at Princeton University. Today, we're fast forwarding over five year, years of research and just going straight to the results. <coughs> and there's a lot more about the science in here, and I'd be happy to answer more questions at the end for the conservators in the room. I see you guys. Um, <laughs> we chose a blend of B72 and B48N, which are acrylic adhesives commonly used in conservation, but were up until this point not thoroughly tested for use as structural adhesives. It is uh, a reversible adhesive. It has excellent aging characteristics. It resulted in very thin joins and is of comparable strength to marble. For the pinning material, we chose fiberglass, which has a similar modulus or stiffness to marble. And our testing showed that it would not cause damage if the sculpture were ever subjected to a future impact. Not something we want to think about, but it is a possibility. We knew that the break edges on the atom fragments were fresh without any wear from time handling or weathering. They fit together tightly and they needed to be carefully preserved because they're fragile. To help preserve those break edges, we aimed to minimize our handling of the major fragments and so we turned to mock-ups to help us plan the treatment. We agreed early on that in an important goal towards achieving a successful assembly would be to dry fit the entire sculpture. In other words, stack the legs and torso without any adhesive so that we could see how well everything fit together. Remember, at this stage, we didn't know if anything fit together because of the fall. There might have been some distortion or something. We didn't know. So the dry stacking method would be done using an external armature that needed to hold the fragments in place, likely for long periods of time, allow maximum flexibility and adjustment, and allow us to open and close the joins without disturbing the relative positions of those fragments. These goals and basic concepts of the armature came to us easily, but the actual development of the armature required extensive planning. And it all started with this replica of Michelangelo's David made from Sichuan marble and purchased from a website called wishihadthat.com. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no, I, well, to scale, I mean, he's small. I don't know, he's not, no, I would say. No, 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 he's, he's about five feet tall. So no, not full scale. <laughs> um, so we chose this. Uh, replica because he has a similar pose to our Adam and we knew that we could use this stone replica as a working model for designing the armature and trialing different assembly scenarios. We also at that time installed a bridge crane which is essentially a permanent gantry with hoists that hangs from a mu movable rail system, that yellow part there. To use the Chinese David as a mock-up, we needed to break him in a similar way to Adam. <laughs> And so we used feathers and wedges, an ancient method of breaking stone, in which a series of holes is drilled along a desired break line. Two feathers, or slices of metal, are placed into each hole, and then wedges are inserted between them. And then they're tapped with a mallet uh, and to propagate the crack along the line. And his head comes off. <laughs> And here is the David's torso broken similarly to Adam, intentionally broken. Um, and the, torso's le the torso leg and arm pieces were then used to developing, develop the supporting uh, structure, armature for Adam. One of our primary concerns was how to hold the torso 
which weighs about 380 pounds, securely in an affixed position. We also needed the ability to adjust the moment or the angle of this large fragment, and we wanted to suspend it above the leg fragments with the option to move the torso up and down as needed. We started with cardboard prototypes, and then a removable carbon fiber version was fabricated directly on David's torso using layers of carbon fiber cloth laminated with epoxy. This fabric can conform to any shape, and the composite fabric the composite of fabric and epoxy is as strong as steel. The photo on the right shows uh, some early versions of the leg straps that we developed on David. Once we were a bit further along in the development of the armature, we were able to switch to a one-to-one -one scale model of Adam. The laser scans I mentioned earlier were also used to produce these full-scale reproductions of the major fragments made on a CNC milling machine. These fragment reproductions played a crucial role in planning the reconstruction because once we worked at the basic concepts using the David replica, we further refined the external armature using the full-scale model of Adam. This pink model could be used to fabricate the straps that would ultimately hold the sculpture itself. By working indirectly using the David replica and then the full-scale model of Adam, we were able to avoid unnecessary handling of the large fragments. In addition to the large corset, each leg fragment had its own carbon fiber strap that was attached with ball joints to a rigid framework, and that added more adjustability to the armature. Once the armature design was completely worked out, the straps could be removed from the model and then transferred to the stone fragments. And here's how Adam looked on the day we did our first dry run of the sculpture, in which the torso was placed in its corset, all of the leg fragments were placed in the armature, and then stacked up without any adhesives or pins. This dry run allowed us to see for the first time how well all of the leg fragments fit together, and if they aligned with the torso. And they did. They aligned beautifully, so we were really happy. <laughs> the torso hung freely in the corset, and um, threaded rods extend from the flange are attached to the movable rail on the overhead bridge crane. And the base and the leg fragments le rested on a custom made lift table that <coughs> allowed us to raise and lower the legs very smoothly and in fine increments. <coughs> now that the armature was fully realized, we could begin assembling the sculpture. Some major decisions were yet to be made though about exactly where we would put pins. And for that, um, we did additional finite element analysis to help us determine if we should put a pin in the left knee. But first, let's take a look at a short video that features me and my Tulio partner, Michael Morris, that's going to give you a better understanding of how we proceeded with the assembly. The dry stacking method involved adhering one joint at a time, each time stacking all of the leg fragments and then raising them with the lift table to meet the torso. This technique allowed us to use the weight of the sculpture to clamp and hold the joints while the acrylic adhesive reached full strength. It was a system of self-clamping, if you will, applying the same amount of pressure that would be exerted on each of the joints when the sculpture would once again stand freely. The dry stacking method also allowed us to monitor the alignment of the fragments with each joint that was bonded. Once the fragments were fully assembled, the sculpture was left alone, immobile for at least one month, because acrylic adhesives set by a process of solvent evaporation. Only when the legs, uh, only then were the legs disassembled and the process was repeated again for a different join. In the video, you might have noticed that there were pins set into the ankle joints, and that's something that we all agreed was necessary. Another area we felt needed extra stability was the left knee, but we did not agree on whether or not to pin it. And to help us decide on this issue, we went back to finite element analysis to do a focus modeling of pins in this area. We wanted to know if there would be any benefit or risk to pinning the left knee. We had questions about the size and position of the pin, and FEA allowed us to virtually test a variety of parameters and visualize stress redistribution in the figure, both with and without a pin in the knee. 
This FEA study incorporated data from our physical and adhesive and pinning testing and that improved the accuracy of that model. After about a year of consideration, we decided to pin the left knee. The FEA model showed that the pin, a pin did not introduce additional strain on that join. But to finalize our decision, we also took into consideration much of what we had learned from hands-on empirical tests we've carried out over the years. This diagram shows all of the pins in the sculpture, which are made of one quarter inch diameter fiberglass rods. That's what I showed you at the beginning. Um, and the ankle pins are two inches long. This is one of the ankle pins. And the knee pin is four inches long. And these are teeny tiny pins for sculpture conservation. So we were really pleased with that. With the decision made, we'd set about creating a drilling armature designed to make perfectly aligned holes, thereby working towards our goal of minimal intervention. The fragment to be drilled was aligned to its mate, and then along with the, its surrounding rigid armature, seen here in gray in the diagram, it was lifted straight up from the base, and a riser, shown in yellow here, was put into its place. The riser allowed for a drilling apparatus, which is tan in the diagram, to be installed onto the armature. Laser lines projected on the setup helped to maintain the relative alignment of the fragments. The drill itself was a small bench lathe turned onto its side and attached to a linear actuator, which allowed the lathe to be moved up and, si up and down, so sort of like an improvised drill press. We used diamond core bits, which are gentle to the stone. First, the drill was placed on the lower spindle of the lathe, and a hole was drilled down into the base. Then it was moved to the upper spindle, and a hole was drilled up into the ankle fragment, which is what's illustrated here. And that allowed us to drill perfectly aligned holes. And if you have a perfectly aligned hole, you need the smallest possible hole. You don't have to keep enlarging it. If you do this by hand, you tend to enlarge the hole in several attempts, and you lose more and more material. Then a separate drilling armature was designed for the left knee. It was similar in concept to the one for the ankles, except that the knee and calf fragments were inverted. Again, using laser lines to maintain our alignment, the fragments were separated far enough to, dr to fit the drill assembly in between, and then a hole was drilled up and a hole was drilled down. And the image on the right shows the four inch pin in place, I highlighted it. Um, in the calf fragment ready for the knee and thigh to be placed on top. As we continued adhering joins, time passed allowing the adhesive to set up. Eventually we were able to remove parts of the armature until the point that we could finally remove the corset and it was a wonderful thing to see Adam freestanding again, looking like a Greek sculpture, as he should. Um, once the torso and legs were com completed, we could then attach the arms. For the left hand, the one that holds the forbidden fruit, no fancy straps were necessary, only a straightforward clamping setup. And the right arm was the most fragmented of all of the elements, comprising more than 10 pieces, and it needed a separate armature to hold the pieces in place as it was bonded. The right arm was fully assembled up to the point where it attached the torso and then awaited the moment it could be put in place, which was a few years later. <laughs> <laughs> to attach the right arm, another carbon fiber brace similar to the torso corset was fabricated to hold it in position. The brace was attached to the overhead rail system with threaded rods so that the arm could be maneuvered under the shoulder of the assembled figure on the table. Then the table was lowered to bring the torso in contact with the suspended arm. And finally, it was time for the head to be attached, producing some of the most dramatic photos from the whole project. <laughs> and this was a big moment for us, and we invited our director at the time, Tom Campbell, uh, to come in and see this momentous reheading. <coughs> that was the picture that was in the New York Times. <laughs> this is a good one. To attach the head, we hung it from a strap that was, that was fashioned out of cotton webbing. 
Once again, we attached up to the overhead rail system, allowing us to maneuver the head away from the sculpture to apply adhesive and then return it to the torso so it could be lowered into place. Raising and lowering this time was done by means of a screw jack that was located between the hanging plate and the overhead rail system. And that's what I'm operating on the picture on the right. On April 1st, 2013, the sculpture was fully assembled and ready to be moved to a space with plenty of natural northern light for the final stages of the project, cleaning and filling. <coughs> but before we get to that, uh, the accident prompted a thorough investigation, a thorough examination of the sculpture. So in this section, I'll cover results from our petrographic analysis of Adam's marble, as well as observations we made about tool marks ma uh, remaining on the sculpture. And then I'll tell you about the surface cleaning and how the losses were filled. The absence of any original joins on the sculpture tells us that Adam was carved from a single block of Carrara marble. That Tullio chose Carrara is not surprising, as this was the primary local Italian marble and was used for statuary throughout Europe during the Renaissance. But to dig deeper, my colleague Jack Sultanian collaborated with Lorenzo Lazzarini from IUAB University in Venice to perform a petrographic examination of the marble. Of the three main quarrying districts in Carrara, Colonata, Miscelia, and Toronto, our study suggested that the marble derived from Toronto, seen here in this slide. The results also indicated an even more specific location, that of Polvaccio, which has the reputation of having the marble of the finest quality, so-called statuarial marble. <coughs> Curiously, our Adam sculpture is not highly polished. Adam is considered to be the first full-scale nude since antiquity to absorb the classical canon. So we know that Tullio was referring to antique prototypes that he no doubt encountered and studied in his lifetime. The decision not to polish may relate to the appearance of ancient marbles, which would have lost any, any original polish <coughs> due to extended burial. The front surfaces of the figure were never highly polished, but thin, faint lines from an abrasive stone or file can be seen on close inspection. Adam's hair is fully defined at the front of his head with tightly wound curls. Tulio used drills of varying sizes to define the center of each ringlet and give further definition to the depths of the hair by drilling a sequence of small holes adjacent to one another. The most completely finished curls um, Tulio used a tiny chisel to remove the narrow portions, partitions of marble between the holes. Moving from the back of the head toward the face, there's a transitional area where Tulio drilled holes plotting out the center of these curls, as well as some shallow arcs created with a flat chisel. The curls are superficial, but they begin to take shape as they progress towards the front with deeper carving and more definition. In this sequence from back to front, the roughed out volume slowly progress from a flat description of curls to a fully realized form. On the back of Adam's head, there are no curls at all. Instead, there's just a broadly defined <coughs> mass of marble for the hair that re resembles a snood. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he referred to it. <laughs> Adam was carved to stand in a niche on the Vendorman Monument, and as such, the back, like the hair, was not highly finished, um, and the, in these areas, we can see Tulio's carving method. Deep rasp marks define the upper back, spine, and lower back. These marks must surely reflect on how the front of the sculpture appeared before being taken to its final level of finish. Rasp marks articulate the back muscles in a manner not dissimilar to the shading lines used by draftsmen to indicate shadow and light. Several chisel marks on the back of the neck remain, just beneath the hair, indicating um, that early in his carving process, Tulio used chisels to mar model large, broad areas. This chiseling was followed by working with a series of rasps, ranging from coarse to fine, to delineate the muscles. Now this detail shows uh, an area on the upper surface of the base, where there's a mysterious, almost square area in front of the tree trunk. Is it simply unfinished, or was there something here that was intentionally removed? This square um, cuts into the mossy base of the tree trunk, creating a really straight line. 
We never came to an inclusion, a conclusion about what happened here, um, but it certainly is interesting. <laughs> the underside of the sculpture's base was never previously sculpt, uh, studied, and that's because it was essentially inaccessible until the sculpture was damaged. But we found that this surface is covered with intersecting tool marks that indicate that we're looking at the exterior surface of the original dress block of marble. We see a perfectly level surface flattened with a tooth chisel. In addition to this dressed surface, there are perfectly straight lines cut with a point chisel at right angles to each other, possibly indicating the center of the block. It appears that these straight lines were intended to demarcate the sculpture's proportions. Two circles offset from one another um, indicate the location of the tree trunk. Maybe two different versions of that. The underside of the base also features faint grooved pattern along the edges making a th uh, made with a thin curved chisel or roundel. These grooves are likely uh, the perimeter lines for the bottom of the base as it was laid out on the quarried block. Once those lines were established, the central section from the bottom of the block could be carved into plane. The rear face of the plinth, seen here inverted while being cleaned, would have been situated against the back of the niche, and it was also unfinished and may be a remnant of the original block. This surface was flattened with a toothed chisel and is marked with two vertical incised lines, uh, one of which connects at a right angle to one of the lines on the underside of the face. <coughs> All of these incised lines, if projected up the height of the figure, correspond to its center of gravity and apparently indicate the position of the hands, which are also the outermost reaches of the sculpture. Visualizing the shape of the marble block in this way helps us to understand how carefully the sculpture had been laid out on the exterior, which was almost certainly marked with many other incised lines and marks. Moving to the top of Adam's head, there are tool marks that seems to correspond uh, to the tooth chisel marks on the underside of the base. There are two intersecting lines within this tooled square that appear to define the center of the block and are related to those found on the underside of the base. It's likely that these lines were maintained by the artist as points of reference throughout the entire carving process. That this center mark remains in place suggests that Tulio carved his figure with the minimum of waste, fitting Adam precisely within the original block. Such economy is achievable only through careful planning. The sculpture was also examined to determine whether it might have been partially gilded, as we know many Renaissance marbles were. The Benderman Monument, from where our Adam comes, has several areas of gilded decoration. While no gilding was discernible on Adam, traces of a reddish brown material uh, were found in, on the fruit held in Adam's left hand. This material was analyzed by Federico Caro from our Department of Scientific Research at the Met, and it was found to contain clay minerals and iron oxides, and that's consistent with bowl, a preparation for gilding. So it's possible that this area of the sculpture, at least, was gilded. So now let's go back to the treatment. The marble was dirty, and he had never, the Adam had never been cleaned since it entered the Met's collection. At least we weren't aware of it being cleaned. Particularly dirty were the horizontal areas of the sculpture, places like the shoulders, the base, the feet. Cleaning the surface, though, was not straightforward. During the sculpture's history, animal fat was applied to the surface, both to imply gloss to the surface, and as a means, so it was believed, of mitigating salt contamination. This technique was typical for marbles of Italy. The fats applied to the surface sank into the marble, darkening and yellowing over time. You can see in this section of Adam's leg just how deeply the fats penetrated the surface. There's a distinct yellowish ring around the circumference in which um, in places measures up to a quarter inch wide. These fats which were analyzed, analyzed by Adriana Rizzo um, from our Department of Scientific Research, turned out to be largely tallow and are not readily soluble, guaranteeing that this discoloration could not be uh, safely extracted from the stone. 
The unevenness of application of these fats over the years resulted in an uneven tonality on the sculpture's surface. So he knew that if the marble were cleaned to the same degree everywhere, there'd be a risk of overcleaning in some areas while other areas might end up looking darker. So to ensure balance and even tonality, my colleague Jack Sultanian, who cleaned the sculpture, chose to do a selective cleaning. In this way, areas of ye less yellowing were cleaned more lightly than parts that were more significantly yellowed. And here's our atom after cleaning. And at this point, we could finally move on to filling the losses. Our goal for loss compensation was to integrate the fills as closely as possible with the surrounding stone. We considered this approach necessary in the case of Adam for both aesthetic and philosophical reasons. Because the breaks were largely horizontal, if they were left undisguised, they would interrupt the strict verticality of the figure, so essential to its impact. These interruptions could be corrected only by making the fills less visible. We also believed that as the losses were caused by an accident, they did not represent a moment in time that needed to pre be preserved, or at least not by laying the burden of this history on the sculpture itself. And we also felt that taking the fills to the highest aesthetic level was further justified by our thorough documentation of the accident and the treatment. The fills were made with B72, our familiar uh, acrylic resin, both with synthetic onyx, which is a blend of powdered aluminas, along with dried pigments on occasion. The aim was to achieve a similar translucency to the marble, but leaving the fill slightly lighter than the surrounding stone. After shaping, the fills were retouched with dry pigments in a polyvinyl acetate medium called Moalith 20. And here we see the sculpture after cleaning, filling, and impainting. And I want to credit our amazing photographer, Joe Kosha, who took these photos. And he's just an incredible photographer of marble sculpture. They're really beautiful. And Adam returned to public view in November of 2014. And I'm just going to leave you with two more final slides showing Adam as he was installed in his new gallery space, accompanied by videos about the conservation project. This was a six-month exhibition where Adam was in the center of the gallery, and you could he was relatively low on the pedestal, and you could walk all around and examine him in great detail, get right up in there, because we didn't want to imply in any way that he required being in a niche, which is where he is now. The niche was because he comes from a niche, so they put him back in a niche. <laughs> but we didn't want to ha create any controversy by putting him in a niche without people being able to walk around him right away, because this is how he's always been displayed at the Met in the round. Um, so now in the space, there's a sculpture from Venice and the Veneto region, and I would welcome you all to come and see him. Um, Knowledge is created and absorbed from diverse experiences. In the end, conservators had to carry out the reconstruction of Adam, relying on all of the knowledge acquired from the supporting studies, but also relying on their experience and their senses. No amount of scientific study could guide us in knowing how well aligned a fragment might be to its mating surface, or whether enough adhesive covered the join or had squeezed out. We knew these things by feel. Perhaps the project's greatest lesson was establishing an arc from virtual to material reality and finding and valuing the contributions of each participant in the successful completion of that arc. Thank you. And I just want to tell you that a, a time lapse video is going to come up, continue to ask questions, but there's going to be this cool video in the background that might, <laughs> might get people's attention. But please go ahead and ask a question if you wish. In your first image, when you showed it, Adam, that they had fallen yes. with all the thousands of little pieces, it was as if we saw dust on the floor. There was a lot of dust. So, on the floor. what happened to the dust? It's all been collected. Did you, did you use that in the no, we thought 
there was a chance we could use it in the filling material, but marble dust mixed into an acrylic resin doesn't look that good. It seems like the obvious choice to go to to create a marble effect, but it kind of goes gray and dull and it's not that great. So we just saved it and there's there are a lot of fragments that didn't go back on the sculpture. Internal fragments, especially in that, um, no, I'm sorry, this arm um, where there was just loss. You could see through it when we assembled it. So um, that's now the acrylic fill? Yeah, so there's some plaster in the inside and then the acrylic is more on the surface. So um, in a porcelain restoration, so often those fills discolor. Yeah. Will that well, happen? Well, that's probably because they're using certain epoxy uh, fills. That's something of old, of course, on restorations, maybe newer yeah, ones. Yeah, but you know. I mean, depending on your choice of materials, there's a lot of different kinds of epoxies, and they tend to yellow over time. So do you um, think maybe in a but we didn't 20 use years, 50 years, we'll start to see Not with, because the, the medium, our resin for the Adams fills was the acrylic resin B72, and that's a wonderful material we use in conservation, and we were quite confident in its stability over the years. How long has it been in use? Uh, it's been in use since the 50s, the 1950s. since the 1950s, <laughs> and um, <coughs> it, it doesn't yellow, it doesn't yellow. So I don't think if there are any problems with the fills, I don't think it'll be with yellowing. I think if we had chosen an epoxy for the fills, there, there, even with some of our best epoxies, there's always that chance for yellowing. Uh, but we don't believe it's going to happen with mm -hmm. the acrylic resin. And then one other final question. How long did it take you to clear out all the debris from the Velez Walker pit? It was a good part of a day. That's all. And then the, the second day to remove the really big pieces because we needed the riggers uh, to help with the torso. So the gallery was only closed for? It was like a day and a half. Oh as it happened on a Sunday night, Monday we cleaned up, Tuesday afternoon was a little more cleaned up. Then it reopened. Wonderful video. Mm. Yeah. Really, really great. Can you see a little bit about what happened? Like, what was wrong with the pedestal that made this collapse? And did, yeah. then did the museum go through and check every other pedestal? <laughs> 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 yeah. Who built that pedestal? <laughs> um, some of this gets into a little tricky territory, so I'll just tell you um, what I know. And that is the pedestal wasn't built properly. It collapsed because it had bad joinery. And then we also know that the pedestal was made by an outside contractor. Um, so you can kind of fill in <laughs> from there. Uh, but we definitely, immediately, all of the pedestals in that space were, were created at the same time, at the time of the new marble, white marble floor. I don't know if any of you are Bellas Blanco aficionados, <laughs> but there was a period, and I showed it early in the, f in the slideshow, uh, when the floor was this sort of purple marble, um, and then they changed it to a white marble floor. All the pedestals were redone, and it was reinstalled. So all the pedestals were the same, uh, from the same uh, round of installation, mm -hmm. and they were all uh, reinforced immediately. They were clamped and then reinforced. Mm -hmm. And then something else that happened out of this project was just a complete change in the way we design um, and fabricate our pedestals and install art hanging on the wall, and there's just mm -hmm. a whole new protocol mm -hmm. for the way that happens. So it's changed. It, this this project or this accident had a, a major effect on the way we do things at the museum. I'm just curious about the cost. <laughs> <laughs> Not just the money, but, yeah, um, no object. but the conservator's time, since the museum parlance, that's amongst the most expensive and yeah. determinant yeah. Of features of the calendar. Yeah. Uh, that's a, everybody always asks about money, and I can't, t I can't tell you how much we spent on the project, because I don't know. It was a lot. It was a lot. The project was um, <coughs> funded by an insurance settlement. It's the only time the museum ever took an insurance claim. Um, and that's, that uh, in 
insurance money covered my salary for the whole time I worked on it and everything else. Um, so they created a position, my position for large scale sculpture started out as the Tulio position and that was my job until it was done. I did other things, there were lots of other projects that came up and you know interrupted this project here and there, but um, that was my primary focus. And so they were able to dedicate that, I mean, it wasn't just me, it was so, so many other people working on it, but there was one person who could have that as their primary focus. And um, anyway, so yeah, it was insurance money. When you say insurance yeah. money, does that mean like the Mets homeowner's insurance policy or the fabricator of the pedestals insurance? No, the Mets oh, I don't know, art, art sure. coverage. Oh, okay. I really, I, I'm kind of better to not know <coughs> anything about it because like, I, it's not something I should be talking about, but that's it. That's all I know. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. Oh. So easy ones. Where's the Eve? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's an easy one. <laughs> do you feel the, I mean, that's remarkable. Have you? Mm -hmm. I want to cry. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the methods that you developed, the protocols, mm -hmm. have other parts of the world that have suffered a boo boo contacted you and say, okay, we just lost yeah. a, a, yeah, a, a lion to the lion. Have your, has your work been yeah. a benefit to other people? So Eve and benefit. Okay, first Eve, we don't know where Eve is. Oh, whoa. Eve, Gosh. Eve is lost. Um, and there's a little bit, if you um, look in the articles uh, in the journal, uh, there's a little bit about Eve, but uh, there's either she was never finished or she was lost very early on. There's a drawing from the 18th century of the tomb that shows an Eve, um, and there was an Eve, and it's at the Venderman Palace now, uh, but it's not the one that his match. It's a more mannerist later piece. So mm -hmm. if something happened to her, like Adam, and she was never recovered, that she was replaced, mm -hmm. or we don't know. We don't. There's, there's no uh, info on that. And other people come and, and say, no. definitely other people have called me. <laughs> I get calls pretty regularly. Not like all the time, but you know, a few a year. Things break. Things happen. And um, this was a pretty spectacular <laughs> fall. But things happen. Like smaller things happen. Marble breaks and people call me. And I think that um, that was one of our, uh, our beliefs that this project would end up informing other conservators. The questions that we were answering about adhesives and pinning were really basic. And nobody really had the time or uh, resources uh, to devote to that study. And it, would, it had been happening but sort of sporadically over the but you years, a disaster. and you know something like this focuses the attention, and we knew that this was really important information just to get to the bottom of this acrylics question, and you know how many pins do you really need? Because pinning every single join, it's a tradition, but it's not necessary. We our adhesives are so much more advanced than they were in antiquity, in the Renaissance, in the 19th century. We don't need to do that anymore. And that's what all of this research helped us with. And so we could really take a minimalist approach and people are, are using that. And that's why we we're happy to get this published and share it. That brings me to my question. Actually, could you talk about the bad old days of pinning and what's gone wrong with the different types oh. of pins that have been used? Yeah. So. Bad old days of pinning, well, iron, iron pins, um, and exposure, you know, iron rusts if it's exposed to moisture. And um, what happens, it, the worst case scenario is that that pin, internal pin, um, corrodes and expands, and then it breaks the marble. And you have really serious damage. And then the, the pinholes that were drilled in the past were huge. Like, we're talking if the leg is like this, then the pinhole's like this. So you have very little marble <coughs> even left. Um, so you're reducing the strength of the marble, you're 
introducing a material that could possibly expand and break the marble. Um, so the, the battle days was sort of big poles, lots of loss of material, and, and um, but it was necessary. I mean, they didn't have epoxy, they didn't have acrylic resins, they had shellac and lead and plaster. They were very weak bonding materials. So the pin became a lot more important than it was for us, more critical to the structure. Yes? I, I, you mentioned the precise and the idea of this. Yeah. The statue being an allegory of divine and artistic creation. And I just couldn't help think of the symbolism of this is that. Yeah. But it's occurred to all of us. You're <laughs> <laughs> I, I have tons of technical questions. Um, and I want to just thank you um, for seeing how a modern, um, in, in a way, it's as close as. as, as Close an example of, uh, as I know of a lot of conservative dealing with the kinds of specific problems that earlier um, you know, statue restorers mm -hmm. worked on in the 17th and 18th century, but with major in Renaissance, you know, but with yeah. major differences. So it's, it's so instructive to just think of what's different and similar to your your challenges to what you know generations and generations of mm -hmm. conservatives in the past have faced. <coughs> but my the question I'd like to ask you is more about um, you know the aftermath of all of this. About how you present an object like this to the public once something like this has happened. Right. And, and obviously, the first time you unveil it, you feature all those. You know, this is what's in the public's mind. Um, it's a recreation, it's a new of that in mm -hmm. sense. But I know it's not your you know, call, but what are your thoughts about the desirability? I mean, everything you've shown us is to make your intervention invisible. Um, and so, what is the desirability of uh, even? alerting the public <laughs> to the fact that this happened. Yeah. Because what's the danger, in other words, of drawing attention away from what this statue was doing in the museum before this accident happened? And what is the value of drawing attention to the accident and then the process that the museum went through? Do you have thoughts yeah. on that as a conservator? Yeah, so I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I have thoughts. Well, let's just say that in the beginning of the project, um, when I what became the Tulio Conservator. Uh, it was kind of the motto of the project was no one must see the fragments. That was my interpretation. <laughs> like, we're, no one's going to see this. We're just going to put it together and put it out. And we didn't, the museum in general did not want anyone to see. Sorry, just to clarify, you mean it, they didn't want images of the fragments going out of the Yeah, the they didn't want images. They didn't want the memory of mm -hmm. the damaged sculpture mm -hmm. in anyone's minds. They didn't want to share those, certainly not before it was assembled, just so that there wouldn't be um, any kind of conflation of what was happening. And so there was uh, quite a bit, it wasn't publicized. I mean, there was a, a press release that it happened, but then for many years there was just nothing. Like, there was all kinds of stuff happening, but there was nothing in the press. And I presented a couple of papers about our a research, but it was more like you know adhesives for marble and pinning for marble, um, and I it was hard for me because I knew we were doing really great stuff, and I kind of wanted people to know <laughs> that we were making progress, and it wasn't because people were writing to the museum saying you know what's going on, you know it's just lost, isn't it just lost? It's lost, <laughs> and there was an impression that because so many years went by with no update, that there was nothing, it wasn't recoverable or there was nothing happening or whatever. So that was hard for me, but I think as we progressed, and Michael and I did the dry run and we saw that it was, there was a, so much potential. I mean, we conservators always knew where we were headed, but it just, I think there was a big moment with that dry run and seeing it assembled. And I think that's when people were like, oh, you know what, this is gonna have a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> and then things started, to loosen up a little bit, there was an article in the New York Times highlighting the, um, the 3D uh, laser scanning and Ron Street's work that he did, um, and that showed a 3D model of the sculpture with, you know, each fragment was a different color, and it, it sort of was the first time that was revealed. And then, toward the end of the project, things really ramped up in terms of 
I mean, I was always keeping video recordings of what we were doing and photography all the time, and then we finally managed to convince our digital media department to come in and film us because we knew this was going to, we had to have something ready. We needed like a little documentary, which is on the website. It's really great. Take a look. It's only eight minutes. But all of those things very slowly developed over time. And I think initially the sculpture would have just gone right back out into the gallery with no fanfare. But because we had all this beautiful documentation and it was so well known that the sculpture fell, everybody reached a point where they agreed that the, this should be um, very transparent, very open in the gallery. And that's why we had these screens that showed um, the research and the reassembly process. And I was just thrilled to have that because I can't imagine just putting that sculpture out and, I mean, we were working on the publication, but if that was not enough, we needed, I felt that we needed something for the public. So I think that, you know, but I don't think it was the conservators necessarily just pushing for it alone. I think that everybody agreed. Um, but then, that was six months, he went back into the niche, and now the, there's a label uh, just talks about the sculpture, but doesn't mention the accident. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest, I've never listened to the audio guide. <laughs> I don't think that the, there's an audio guide entry for Adam, but I don't know or think that it mentions the conservation. And I think I'm a little disappointed in that, um, because you have to know about the accident to um, dive, and dive in and, and learn that story. The, the museum doesn't take you there. So there's plenty of info on the website. You just have to know to look for it. It doesn't, when the object, on the, the object page on the website doesn't mention it and the label doesn't mention it. So I have, I mean, personally, it'd be nice if, even if it was mentioned on the website. It's a little bit of an orphan. Yeah. But, so yeah, I mean, but also, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to fight that way. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because there's a precedent when the Gubbio's de Yolo was restored, there was also a very yes. long, drawn out That's process right. of research, and it was very similar, even though it wasn't broken. Yeah. But it was a lot of money was spent on it. And then, similarly, when it reopened, there was a whole little exhibition mm -hmm. about the restoration of it. And then, um, Sometimes you see one of the panels from that exhibition, like in the conservation labs, mm -hmm. you know. So, but it just disappeared, and I don't yeah. think there's anything on the website. Well, about it, um, so. No, but there's a there's a publication, there's like a there's a book. But I mean, these publications is not really. Yeah, what we but I guess the point, <laughs> of the, you know, the larger point is, um, it seems somewhat. I mean, to just pretend it didn't happen. I mean, I think. We all have that feeling when something breaks and we yeah. need something to replace it. We were, I was mm -hmm. actually talking about this with Jen, like the idea that you can erase the loss if you get something exactly like it to put in its place and then you don't have to have that painful yeah. experience. Yeah. So there's something kind of emotionally dishonest about it, which is, I think, what you're yeah. responding to. On yeah. the other hand, I mean, it really isn't part of what people go to the museum to see. Right. Or but but one I, thing I, I found know. just from this whole presentation is it gave me a much and I've looked at a lot, a lot of sculpture in the last 50 years. It gave me a much better appreciation of that thing just coming out of the soft block of marble yeah. mm -hmm. than I had before. I think in a certain way it's, it, it could be part of an art history lesson and appreciation lesson. Mm -hmm. Just the verse on that pedestal. I know, Absolutely. it was a mind blowing. Yeah. It was mind blowing just to look at that surface. Yeah. It's like, this is the block. So to sweep this it under the rug just seems really dumb. Well, that's all in our article. <laughs> all of that, all the tool marks, everything. I mean, the, the science is covered in a very superficial way, but you know, much more than I talked about today. And, I, you know, I would like it to just be acknowledged, but also I understand the curators don't want this to be the broken sculpture. I mean, it stands on its own in our history. It doesn't need to have the accident to bring it forward, but the accident did bring it forward. Yeah. And yeah. the reason that it's in this gallery now is because of the accident. So if you know that history, um, but not everybody.
also it's, think how many anyway, of those you could probably save because of the pedestal thing. Well, that's, 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 that's yeah. also part of the social life of the object. Right, right. And that's the part that why it's hard to kind of gloss over it. But then almost nobody remembers when that idiot took the sledgehammer to the piazza. There you go. We all do. So now that you've done all this you know, great research, do you have a program to look at other sculptures that had previous restoration and, and sort of fix <laughs> you know, restoration work that might that would No. Be I mean, we would, we would only do that if there were a really obvious need, because um, there's so many other things going on. Um, How so do you no. monitor the, sort of the stability of something that's been for you work, know, something that has more restoration? To sort of just Look at it every once in a while and then put your hands on it. I mean, there was a lot of every, you know, it, I did this all the time. And every, you know, the joints, like you become, you get to memorize the way that it feels and if there's any movement. Because that's what happens when you're making these joints. The adhesive takes so long to yeah. solidify that you're obsessed with the alignment, you know. And um, anyway, I think if I, I mean, I look at the sculpture regularly. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, there's yeah, other pieces with, like, you know what I mean? Like something that's for sort of the 19th century that you have. So if you would just have to do, the, you know, condition checks. Yeah. So the really important point actually is the one that Deborah brought up. Um, she focused on the emotional yeah. issue. But in the context of cultures of conservation, which is the auspices that brought you here, which is thinking about the role of conservation and conservators going forward uh, in the world of object study. It seems to me that this is actually a really significant point that a project which was entirely in the hands of conservators is now effaced effectively uh, from the public consciousness. I mean, yeah, it's in publications for the conservators to go look at. And I would have thought that for the conservation community, this, is a, this sh could have been or should be a big deal because it reflects a kind of old-fashioned view that the museum is run by the curators, mm -hmm. that the work of conservation is done in the basement and should stay in the basement. And so in spite of efforts elsewhere to put conservators in the galleries doing their work, that at least in one museum, it's still the 19th century. And I wonder if, yeah. and we can turn the video off for this, you know, I wonder <laughs> if for the conservators no. in the Met, you know, this, is, this was something yeah. that was discussed Significantly. Well, the I mean, the decision to not the that label, the final label that's there now, that wasn't even that there was no discussion about that. I mean, I kind of saw that label and I was like, oh, I wonder if they're gonna. It's when it went back into the niche and then a label went up and I looked at it, going, I wonder if it has anything about the conservation. Oh, look, it doesn't. I wonder if the audio guide does, and then I never listen to the audio <laughs> guide. Uh, so you're right; it wasn't it wasn't even a discussion. But I f uh, I feel like probably because of the period of time that we had the conservation exhibition, you know, that with the two screens, and it was near six I, you know, I don't know why, and I. I mean, maybe I should fight again for that label to be changed to add, yeah, even just if it's why. just it's mentioned. What said. It's that mm -hmm. mentality. It's, mm -hmm. it's also the bad. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right. It just it was like the the sculpture. We want the sculpture to just be back to being himself mm -hmm. and not the sculpture that fell. But still, I just don't think that you can. I think you can still mention it in the label without it constantly being. Power of denial. Yeah, I mean, it's such a major accomplishment. Huge, yeah. It's sort of the, a similar point, but from a different perspective. It seems to me, based on some work, some some work I've done in certain museums, that conservation has been a little bit secretive in its own practices. Often, things have been. Yeah, it's a two-way street. And so there hasn't been it's as true. much willingness, because probably of these fears of, oh, you changed it or you did it wrong. Or, uh -huh. So I'm sort of curious about how that plays out in this conversation as well, because here obviously you're being very public, right? But there is a history of in your profession, I think, of not being so. Yeah, but I don't think that's so current now. It's I mean, not. there, there are. 
I think there are always going to be people who are secretive and, you know, scholars are secret. Everybody has, there are people who tend to be like, don't look. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I think conservators tend to be very open uh, with their work, at least in my experience now. And it wasn't, I wanted to talk about this right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought, what's the point of keeping this secret? This is what's happening. We, everybody knows it broke. We're doing really good work. Let's talk about it. Yeah. But it wasn't it wasn't an option until we were much farther along. Yeah, and that seems like part of a new professionalization where it's less sort of guild-like and we, yeah. we have yeah. these secret potions that we yeah, use so I think that we'd to glue things come together. A long right? way in that right. way. Certainly with social media, people are posting things. <laughs> yeah, things it's incredibly media. politicized. I mean, look at Italy. Look at the scandals. Mm -hmm. The Sistine yeah, Chapel. The yeah. yeah. The, uh, right. what was the statue up you in the north somewhere too. that, oh, uh, Queen Beck and all those <coughs> arguments. I mean, it can be ruinous to someone's that. career as well. Right. I think you have to be very careful because ultimately it reflects on the museum's stewardship. Right. I think the message has to be, yeah, well, that's where I that's get about nervous about social media, too. Okay. And because that's where the, the less careful, less thought out kinds of things start to happen. But, but also, I mean, yes. one, one thing that's really <laughs> obvious that nobody's mentioned is that traditionally museums don't want the conservation information out there because it affects the value mm -hmm. of the work mm -hmm. they have. It affects mm -hmm. how much they're worth mm -hmm. and how important they are. Do a conservation project that um, basically demotes something from being what it's supposed to be to being something else, a school of, or or, or that it's had a past conservation that's been set up that it's not whole, that it's not intact, that it's not integral. Yeah, but museums are devices for obscuring the past of objects and getting them new lives. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's consistent with right, but like every piece of furniture, every Renaissance piece of furniture, for example. Yeah, what's you know, right. it's, it's not. It's not Renaissance. Painting everything. Yeah, like so I mean, that's one of the reasons that traditionally conservation is not a, a public, I mean, and, you know, it's like when you get work done on your body, right? You don't walk around. Especially <laughs> 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 knee replacement. But I think I think that's why I want to keep people in the I think that what uh, people are realizing about conservation, and we're trying to take this approach in our department, is that the public thinks conservation is cool. They're yeah. fascinated conservation and it's a way of drawing people in getting people interested and uh, you know raising funds like mm -hmm. we we like to think of ourselves and Lisa Pelosi our department head uses this approach like use us we're we're here to tell the stories people are engaged in our stories mm -hmm. and if they're engaged and interested they give money mm -hmm. so I think that you know that's mm -hmm. another way to think about conservation mm -hmm. it's not just like um, there's, I don't know, there's a lot of ways to think about it, but um, people are interested in conservation, and that's what the Met is start, you know, has has begun to realize. Um, and I think that the, this uh, exhibition about the Tulio project was a really big deal. We had never, I mean, there was the the Gubbio, the but that what, that was in the mid '90s or something. I mean, it had, there had been yeah. nothing, almost nothing, there were brief mentions of conservation. So we were really thrilled to have that. About what year was those were those pedestals built? Collapsed? I think I think those I were built in two thousand. Two thousand wow. two years before the oh, oh. fall. Oh my god, that's yes. amazing. So they didn't last long. At least that one didn't last long. No. So everyone's welcome to talk to Carolyn after we are actually yeah.